All righty, guys. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, Tuesday edition of uh, our Ask the Doctor segment. My name is Mitchell Holzer. I'm the uh, Vice President for Wellness Biosciences. Uh, it's exciting. Welcome to all the uh, first-time guests that we have. Uh, we'll have a uh, informative session tonight with uh, with one of our, our co-founders and uh, chief medical doctors, uh, Dr. Nick Jasani, who's a, a board-certified oncologist. So we're we're definitely uh, privileged to have uh, Dr. Jasani on the call. Uh, he just always adds a lot of great great insight to uh, the science of CBD, how that affects the endocannabinoid system, and so. We'll we'll jump into uh, a few uh, few questions here in just a little bit, but I want to go ahead and uh, welcome Dr. Jasani to the call. And as we we start, I know we have uh, a few new fee, few new folks that uh, have joined us here this evening. So if you could uh, give a little bit of your your background, Dr. Jasani, and um, and then also go into a little bit how you got into the uh, the cannabis CBD space. Uh, letting us know a little bit about that would be great, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. But also, just so for our new attendees, if you have any questions, you know, I'm going to be hosting the call along with our our CEO and co-founder, Mr. Barry Koshu. If you if you uh, feel free, if you have a question, you could text me. My number is uh, 713-299-1935, or you can get that question to whoever invited you on the call, and then they could uh, they could forward those questions to me as we get started. So, so with that, we'll go ahead and kick off. Dr. Jasani, uh, take it away, and uh, we'll we'll get the call started. All right, thank you, Mitchell. Um, good evening, welcome everyone. Uh, you know, as a little bit about myself, I'm a practicing medical oncologist. That means I see patients full time. I've been practicing as an oncologist <clears throat> for well over about 15 years now, and that's really my passion is is treating patients and following patients. You know, a little bit of how I got into this was three, four years ago, I started noticing lots of patients coming in and asking me about various supplements with CBD and how it was going to interfere and is it okay to take it? What are the side effects? What are the interactions with their treatment? What do I know about any efficacy with it? And it led me to have, you know, a little bit of a deeper dive into the science. And there was a tremendous amount of science and <clears throat> pathophysiology that has really been researched through the neurology fields and a lot of international uh, literature. So, you know, that really kicked it off. And then as I started seeing patients uh, having improvement with natural naturopathic plant-based supplements, I started to kind of get really more into it. And then that led me up to with Dr. Patel and Wellness Biosciences, who I've been with since um, they've <clears throat> originated and since we founded it. And I've really found a lot of pleasure in, in educating people on how do you incorporate these products? How do you talk to other doctors and allied science-based um, uh, professionals about it and how do you incorporate these products in using the right data and the clinical trial data and what can you say and what can't you really say because there are a lot of marketing and things going on now that are really overstepping what the data tells us and it is important to be kind of honest to the public and to the patients um, when we do talk about these compounds. All righty. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jasani. Uh, one, one of the questions, this is always seems to be a popular one for, for the new folks is, you know, we, we see a lot of these uh, CBD stores, um, vape shops popping up everywhere, franchises. Uh, if you could give uh, everybody here that's new to the call, what, what are some of the kind of main differences between the, the product line that you would see with uh, wellness biosciences versus what would be out there typically on the market? Uh, yeah, you know, <clears throat> I'll give you a quick bird's eye view because the science and, and the detail of processing and cultivating these plants is quite tremendous. Um, <clears throat> they're bioremediators. They will hold everything in the soil from heavy metals to pesticides. It is, and it is an unregulated industry. The FDA um, has not come down and really set too much regulations for CBD, which is coming. And it is very important to understand that the cultivation of these products not only have to be done meticulously, you have to test every step of the way, 
processing of these product takes tremendous amount of capital, whether it's supercritical CO2, butane, ethanol, um, gas chromatography to get isolates. I mean, this can continue and go on and on, but the capital it takes and the ability to have the right quality metrics on all of these products is very important. When you don't have set regulations, you can get these products onto market fairly easily and quickly. And when you process a bunch of cannabis or hemp plants, remember you concentrate everything that's in them. So you will concentrate it into an oil. Well, you have to make sure that the pesticides, the heavy metals, and the amount of CBD you're claiming is in it, along with the other terpenes, is real, as well as your extraction process, because extracting these compounds does take talent. It does take the right level of um, equipment. Sometimes you want to have a broad spectrum product with the right terpenes that come with it. That is a complete different physiologic benefit than an isolate you use, which is just purely CBD. It takes a different process in how you process it, and um, it requires different equipment. So, you know, when you go to these places that have CBD, you have to be very careful. We are learning almost 50 to 60 percent of them will not have the right amount they're claiming. will have different compounds such as pesticides and uh, heavy metals above the thresholds. And we would recommend that you buy products that have a third certificate of analysis, an independent certificate of analysis using pretty stringent like California regulations. Because it, like anything else in business, if you're testing it and you're making the product, there is some conflict of interest. So not that you can't trust internal testing. It is always important to have a product that may have a third independent test. Wellness Bioscience has that on all of their batches. If anything is off, they will send it back and it has to be replaced. Um, so quality makes a big deal when you are giving it to people who are ingesting or taking it in, in internally. Um, from a physician standpoint, these are plant-based supplements that have lots of physiologic benefits in the body. They are not medicinal drugs. They're not here to replace medications and drugs for disease processes. We don't have that data yet, but they're adjuncts and they're supplements that work well. You just got to make sure the quality is correct. Yeah, thank you. So just to kind of piggyback on that, Dr. Jasani, um, you know, there are um, a lot of companies that that probably don't have the certificate of analysis like like you're referencing. And why don't you speak to why that is? And then if what is your best estimate of the providers that are out there in the marketplace that do not have this certificate of analysis? Uh, I think it comes to cost. It is expensive. Um, you do have to add extra cost and you probably alter the supply chain a little bit because you are batch testing and third certificate of analysis after the cultivators and processors. Um, I would say um, maybe 10%, 15% at most, if that, have a third party certificate of analysis. <clears throat> okay. And so, which means, you know, for a company like Wellness Biosciences that are already is ahead of the curve, um, you know, that, that bodes well for kind of being the standard bearer, let's call it, uh, for, the, for the industry, having these certificate of analysis. And that should eventually open up uh, even more market share for the company. Would you, would you agree for that later on as yeah. these... Uh, more, more regulations are coming. They're going to eventually processing needs to be in GMP type certified facilities. Um, the regulation is coming. So the companies that are going to stay ahead of it will be able to survive. The others will probably have to either consolidate or close once government comes in with a bit more stricter metrics. Um, that takes more cost to comply. <clears throat> so I would suspect in the coming <clears throat> two to three years, you'll see more regulation. Okay. We, we have a, a question, you know, part of the the distribution aspect we, we do, which is different through the medical practices. So we have a, a question here uh, regarding kind of the, the makeup of uh, the practices we deal with. But then um, also, if you could speak to how, how you incorporate the product line that we have, you know, I guess kind of mentioned the, the different uh, products that we do offer. And then how do you incorporate that? First part of the question, how do you in, incorporate that into your, your cancer practice? Uh, yeah, you know, there's a multitude of ways people can do this. Some practices are 
fine with carrying the products on site and having patients, you know, use them or guide them to them if they feel they're appropriate. Other people just tell them, find the patients that they feel it may be appropriate, give them the website and they can go and order it from, which is kind of how I do it. Um, you know, the balm works great for topical anti-inflammation, pain relief. The sleep oil works great for sleep. The balance pill is good for a lot of things, including general well-being, muscle and joint aches, stress relief. So when I speak to patients, I'm dealing with all kinds of patients who are in the midst of active, aggressive chemotherapy for their disease. Some of them are cured breast cancer survivors living their life and back to normal life and have aches and pains from the treatments. Some of them have stress and anxiety. So I do a lot of counseling on prevention, sleep hygiene, using regular mind, body wellness, right way to eat, right way to exercise. And then I incorporate these products. I do find it's not all patients, but there are plenty of patients that have insomnia and pain that I do guide them to our products that go to the site, try it. If it doesn't work, stop in six to eight weeks and we go on to something else. And then if that doesn't work, we go on to pharmacologic therapy similar to the bomb, similar to the balance pill, but you have to have a very honest discussion. You have to tell them that it is a plant-based supplement. There is real physiology behind it. Give them a trial, let them try it four to six weeks, eight weeks. So most of them will say it helped and it worked before I've had to go to pharmacologic therapy. And then there's other people who are just so severe you can't start with that. You, you, you know, those are not the appropriate patients. <clears throat> okay. You know, also a uh, second part to that question, if you could give uh, everybody, there's a question about what type of doctor practices do we, we typically work through? Um, if you could give some of the specialties that uh, are. I would say your highest is internal medicine and family practice. They deal with the most breadth of patients and you're dealing with certain conditions right now for CBD and CBD, I see a plant-based supplement for stress and well-being, joint aches and arthritic pain, insomnia and sleep. Um, I think that those, it has a huge role and unfortunately, majority of our public is coming in for stress, anxiety, joint aches and insomnia. And we're reaching in and giving them pretty strong pharmacologic therapy, partly because that's all we have and partly because of time. Okay, uh, we've got a, a question that, that came in here. Uh, let me decipher it here. So it says, I'm wondering if the plants and subsequent extracts are tuned for optimal or targeted cannabinoid and or terpene ratios for desired outcomes. Uh, so when you look at the strain of the plant, which comes from the seeds, that, is, that dictates that strain's terpene and cannabinoid profile. Now, what you're seeing on the market in processed goods is people can take out all the CBD they want and do broad spectrum and take the terpenes that come with that plant, or they're just adding back the terpenes to make certain formulations for sleep. Then, you know, there's certain terpenes that are better for calming. There's certain terpenes that are better for energy. There's certain ones that are more sedating. So they can go back and add the right terpenes to make the right product. When you look at the cannabis states and you hear indica and sativa, those nomenclature is going to go away. Eventually, it is going to be the cultivar, the strain based on its unique terpene and um, cannabinoid profile. That is how you should categorize each separate strain um, because they have different physiologic benefits based on the ratios of the terpenes and the CBD and the THC. <clears throat> okay. Uh, one of the questions here is kind of just wondering an update on, um, you know, the House of Representatives passed the, uh, you know, legislation, I guess, to deregulate cannabis in general here a couple of weeks ago. Um, is there any any uh, any time frame as far as the the Senate voting on that? Any updates as far as that uh, regulation that you're here, you've heard of? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the Senate's going to vote to pass it. I think that's already said and done. This is just their typical political games. I do think that every step you see this you get more incremental gain. So I think there is now starting to be a pretty high chance that all of this will lead to the Safe Banking Act passed, which allows banking to enter the sector. 
Then you will see more of this next year. You'll see some criminal expungement and then it will deregulate. I think they're trying to figure out how to tax it and all of that. I don't think it will happen this year. I think safe banking is a realistic measure to potentially pass. Okay. Uh, one of the, the questions, you, you'd kind of reference this a, a little bit earlier on some clinical studies, but if uh, somebody was new, they're looking at a company, um, you know, as a rep, maybe a, a customer, is there any, any particular uh, study or two that deals with, with either pain, anxiety, or sleep that you could recommend to, uh, to them as far as a, a resource that they could go check out that might be available, maybe something that you might have, but something that would give them uh, a little bit more information to study themselves and then possibly utilize with a, a medical doctor? Yeah, those become difficult. We, there's lots. Um, we have compiled a pretty good list of various sites. Um, Dr. Russo's work in the neurology world, he's published lots of articles on the physiology. Now, on, on the endocannabinoid system, on how it works and the interplay with CB1, CB2 receptors, a lot of that knowledge is out there. Um, there are plenty of trials. I would tell you, start with just GW Pharmaceuticals. The company was sold to Jazz Pharmaceuticals. They've been in the space since 1998. They have lots of trials. They have the only FDA approved CBD product on the market for seizures. They're about to have one for pain and it is plant-based CBD and THC. They have a lot of secondary trials where they found immense benefit in their patients with sleep improvement based on sleep quality surveys. They found pain improvement where you're going to see and what you're going to need is randomized clinical trials once this product is deregulated in the U.S. Outside of the U.S., the Israelis, the Spaniards, they have lots of good trials um, showing the efficacy of these compounds. The U.S. is going to have to do these trials at the academic centers once this product is deregulated. And if you can begin to imagine, how do you do a trial where right now only one facility was making all the product, which was out of University of Mississippi that the government was contracting with. Mm -hmm. That was an extremely poor product. So now you're doing trials based on that. You've got to standardize, you know, cultivation and processing of cannabis is a wild west right now. Um, there are lots of techniques and underground people coming out and they're trying to scale it. You're seeing the multi-state operators. All of this has to be put into a more of a scientific realm and it's coming. There's lots of good stuff out there. It's just heterogeneous. That means it varies so much. So, you know, if you connect with us offline, we can kind of send you over a document we have with various websites, links to um, different uh, articles and, and uh, trials. And a lot of it is eye-opening, actually. You can read it. And the neurology world has really looked at this pretty deep. So there's a lot of science behind why these compounds work based on the interplay with the serotonin receptors, and GABA receptors, and how it works, and where in the brain it works, where in the peripheral pain pathways it works. Next steps are going to be randomized trials. And then if you could, uh, thanks for that info. That's good stuff. Um, if, you, if you could give some guidance, if, um, if folks, maybe a clinician has a... Uh, Maybe you can give your experience with, with people coming into a medical practice. Maybe they're on two or three different medicines, high blood pressure, um, you know, maybe something for cholesterol. And then they're going to look at, at something, maybe implementing CBD as part of their, uh, their regimen, their health regimen. How would uh, a, a doctor you would uh, recommend go about that? So, you know, it, a lot of our patients are on numerous medicines. I'd say more than three to four. I mean, many of them five to eight. And that's part of the problem, but some of them are needed. Um, so just like anything else, we have a lot of patients on supplements. If you go and ask them what meds they're on, look and see, they pull out turmeric and all kinds of things. The supplement industry is an unregulated industry. And many of those supplements actually work if you use them for the right conditions. Now, the question is, how do they interact with the existing pharmacologic medications you have? Well, with CBD, and we have a lot of data. GW has tons of data, the pharmaceutical company on high dose CBD. And we know certain things we kind of steer away from. If people are on blood thinners, you, even experts will still use it. 
but we still stay away because it does go through the cytochrome P450 pathway in the liver, and there is a possibility it may alter the anticoagulants and overall seizure meds. Other meds, I've seen most patients do perfectly fine on, and the reality is most people are taking supplements. Your doctor's just not aware. There's a big issue in the medical world of legal liability, but in the end, if you're trying to do the right thing for the patients, you have to just talk to them honestly. If there's a risk, then they have to accept that risk. There's a risk with every medicine you give. We don't tell people to look at the back of a Tylenol bottle because it says liver failure. If you really look at it, you have to look at the percentage that has liver failure. So like everything else, you have to explain to them and see where they get the most value and benefit. But no, I have no problem putting patients and patients taking it with numerous medications. I'll pay attention more if they're on seizure meds or anticoagulants outside of that. No, it's a plant-based supplement. There is no additives in there. Okay. Uh, we have a, both a, a question and then kind of a, a statement behind that. So uh, the question is, are any cell culture experiments planned for evaluating any specific outcomes? Uh, that's the question. And so um, then the statement is, I realize these are very expensive, but you could partner with an educational institution to help you evolve a product to verify claims that are maybe not completely known? The, well, I'll tell you, majority of the data you have, you don't know if you're looking at randomized trials. Um, cell culture trials are, are what you were talking about, bench research, petri dish type of trials. I mean, I'm not sure how much, by that time, your whole industry would have changed. It is going to happen as these products all deregulate. The large academic centers are doing clinical trials, University of Chicago, California, lots of them using varying ratios of CBD and THC for various ailments such as stress, anxiety, pain. Now, when you start looking at it for disease processes, remember it's a plant-based supplement. So yes, there are plenty of rheumatoid arthritis patients, lupus patients, IBS patients, colitis patients that would benefit from this plant product. Now, it's how you incorporate it. You do not tell them that it's there to replace their autoimmune drug because we don't have evidence of that. Even though we may feel it affects immunity and inflammation, we cannot tell a patient to stop their standard of care drugs for it. Now, what it will do is it'll make you feel better. It'll help you with your pain. It'll subjectively help you with your stress and anxiety. While pain is associated with stress and anxiety, IBS, fibromyalgia, colitis, those patients improve maybe because of local regional anti-inflammation effect, that the trials will prove. But it also helps because they have better pain control and stress and anxiety and better sleep. That in turn makes you feel better. So there are lots of different autoimmune conditions. It is the way you incorporate it. And where you start to see a lot of the companies go off the rails is CBD and THC should be used for breast cancer because it's treating the cancer or lupus because it's treating your lupus well that's where you start to make claims that are not true and you need to be very careful and not do that that is a plant-based supplement that helps with those ailments that i speak about uh, and i do think that you're going to start to see these products uh, in pharmaceutical doses because cannabis 3.0 is going to be the biopharma space as they come in with the more uh, modern extraction techniques making active pharmaceutical ingredients starting to really go dive, you know, dive deep into CBN and CBG and these smaller volume cannabinoids, you're gonna see them medicinalize it. And they may use it as a real pharmaceutical med, or they may use it as a parallel line to their pharmaceutical meds, which is more of a plant-based med. So this is all a territory that is up and coming. And yeah, you could do those trials, but I tell you the ability for somebody who comes from the cancer space who does tons of clinical trials, it's quite difficult. And by the time you do it, the technology has moved on. So no, I don't think right now you would be pursuing a cell culture based uh, trial for this. Okay. But there are going on simultaneously here and overseas as we speak. Okay, awesome. Thank you for, uh, for that. That was, that was good. Um, one other question that I have, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Barry for any, any, any comments that he has is uh, how does CBD affect women who are nursing and what are the effects on the baby? We don't know. So we tell people stray with caution. 
I don't, we don't, we can't make stuff up. Uh, we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of medicines that are class C and D with breastfeeding, et cetera. So, uh, you know, you have to judge it on your own independent will and, and ability to risk it. Now, I don't think it causes harm. I mean, CBD and THC are complete plant-based molecules, but we don't yeah. know. So I wouldn't go and start to tell a breastfeeding woman, oh, it's perfectly fine. Go ahead and do it. You need to have an honest discussion that, look, this is an unknown territory and it's okay to be unknown. And most of medicine is unknown. You just have to be honest yeah. and explain that these are the risks and you may want to wait if, if there's any you know, apprehension and the doctors aren't going to be able to tell you hundred percent by any means. Yeah. And then, so that, that's where you would, you know, probably have them refer back to their, their doctor, right? Yeah. And the so, doctor, uh, now there's I mean, the article on lactating women and CBD um, on project CBD. And it talks about all this, how we've seen this for hundreds of years and it goes into it and it shows the data. And in the end, it's, we don't have really definite science. So it's an individual decision. Okay. All right. Well, you know, a lot of great questions that we had. Um, I don't know if anybody has any additional questions. Uh, if, if Marlo or, or David have any uh, additional ones, you know, we could, uh, you know, we, we would be here if we, we could unmute you if you'd like to, but uh, if not, uh, just let us, uh, let us know. But uh, at this time, I'll go ahead, um, turn it over the, the call to our, our CEO and, and co-founder, uh, Barry Koshu, if you'd like to uh, just add anything, Barry, uh, uh, to the uh, the call. Yeah, just uh, just by end by saying, you know, you know, obviously, just you know, Nick is just always phenomenal. He always does a great job of communicating to the extent you know that that we all can listen. But I think that what it reminds me of and what I'm excited about is that there's a whole shift that you see going on in healthcare, and it's it's driven by a lot of different factors right now, but ultimately patients are looking for the best results in every area and they really want to get that information from people that have you know common sense and have distinctive knowledge in these specific categories so we find ourselves in that place uniquely obviously with respect to uh you know to our you know the cannabis industry and we find that in other areas like biologics and, and regenerative medicine it's just amazing when i think about what's you know what I think uh, healthcare is going to be like in 20 years in this country. It, it, it really is uh, mind boggling. So I'm excited about the opportunity to be able to grow and develop a company in, in this space and, and do it with just state of the art people like Dr. Jasani and, and uh, you know, and, and Dr. Patel and, and some other phenomenal doctors that we've had in, and still have, uh, you know, as a big part of what we're doing. So anyway, it, it's exciting time and uh, excited about what's taking place. So uh, yeah, appreciate appreciate you uh, um, and all that you're doing here, Mitchell. I'm excited about what we're doing, man. So back to you. All right. Well, good guys. If uh, if there's no other other questions, you know, we want to value everybody's time. You know, we again uh, appreciate Dr. Uh, Jasani and his wealth of knowledge and the education that uh, that you know both him and Dr. Patel bring. And so uh, I think it definitely makes us unique as a company and. It's fun to get out there and educate folks. So, so with that, we're gonna we're gonna call it a wrap for this evening. But it's uh, been great being with you guys. Um, any, uh, we'll have the the next Ask the Doctor segment in another uh, two weeks. So uh, two weeks from uh, today. So uh, if you have any additional uh, questions, that we can uh, go ahead and answer those next time. So until then, uh, everybody have a great night, and we'll see you the next time. Okay.